we're insulated here. I think that's the best way to raise a family uh, now. I think it's always been the best way to raise a family. Not in an apartment, not in a subdivision, not in a suburban environment, but where, where God's creation is surrounding the home. It's essentially a house should be placed in a situation where God through his creation is just putting a big old hug around it. <laughs> G'day, my name is Mark Makiewiczki and welcome to the Thomas More Center channel. Today it's my privilege to be interviewing Dr. Alan Harrelson. Alan is a historian specializing in the American South and he runs a popular, popular YouTube channel, The Pipe Cottage. More recently, he started another channel under his own name in which he discusses things such as faith, history, literature, land, and other elements of the good life. Alan, welcome to the channel. Mark, it is such a privilege and an honor to be here. I've been looking forward to this quite some time. Wonderful. So I was thinking just for those uh, who are watching who haven't uh, encountered you before, it would be good if you could tell us a bit about your upbringing, your education, and your life at the moment. Well, I was raised in South Carolina. I'm a native-born South Carolinian. And uh, so uh, my roots in the, uh, the Deep South are, are very strong. Um, actually, my wife and I are headed back to South Carolina next week to visit some old friends. And uh, I was raised in a Protestant uh, environment, uh, in, in a Pentecostal environment on top of that. And um, I, I was taught to play uh, music, particularly bluegrass music at a young age. And for a considerable number of years, uh, I traveled around the country with uh, my father and, and some other people uh, from our community, and we played music in probably 25, 30 different states around the Union. And we enjoyed that. And uh, and but but I don't want to get in too much detail here, but I decided to leave South Carolina um, two or three years ago. My wife and I noticed that the state had changed tremendously from what it was uh, when we were children. And I had to decide what type of environment I wanted our children to be raised in. And I've always had uh, an infatuation with the Southern Highlands, uh, the Appalachian South, uh, or the upcountry. There's so many different words to describe it. And uh, this is where we used to come when I was a boy, just like most anybody else uh, who was raised in that part of the South. You'd come to um, the Appalachian Mountains. That's where you would hike with your daddy, where you'd go fishing with your daddy and go camping and <clears throat> have just a wonderful time. Uh, and so I went to uh, the University of South Carolina for my bachelor's degree, the College of Charleston for my master's degree, and uh, Mississippi State University for my PhD in history. And uh, for the past seven years, I have been teaching online as a part of the history faculty at Liberty University in Lynchburg, Virginia. And I am actually now in the process of resigning from Liberty University uh, because uh, I, the opportunities that have opened up because of the Pike Cottage and because of uh, what we're doing uh, online is, is, is taking a lot of time. And so um, it's, it's to the point now where it's becoming a full-time job. Excellent. So uh, we moved to Kentucky a couple of years ago because we wanted a lot of land and we wanted to raise our family in a part of rural America that has not changed very much in the past 40 years. That may con be considered a bad thing uh, for a lot of people, but I think it's very good. Uh, I don't mind change. I just wanted to live in a place where change was more slow to occur and more thought out. Uh, a more place, uh, a more traditional place where there are still people who know how to plant gardens and produce their own food and be responsible for their everyday things. So we've been in Kentucky now for about two years and that that's the current status. Very good. Uh, so just uh, focusing on your education for a moment, um, you wrote your PhD in the 20th century agrarian thought among writers of the American South. Can you tell us more about what sparked your interest in this topic? Well, even as a small boy, uh, 11, 12 years old, I was noticing uh, in my own native state of South Carolina that 
most everybody who was still farming for a living was 60 to 80 years old. Um, I didn't know anybody my age that was involved in an agricultural lifestyle. And I have sort of an intrinsic interest in uh, in farming and agriculture. My grandfather was a tobacco farmer in Ory County, South Carolina for a good while. And the people who I have been involved with, uh, who were my good friends coming up, uh, were all uh, older gentlemen. And um, I began to notice that, you know, there is something peculiarly uh, unique about the way Southerner, Southerners and Southern culture in, in the United States um, has maintained an agricultural lifestyle in agrarian society. So I began, began to, to deal with that. Also at that same time, I, about 13, 14 years old, there was this massive debate in South Carolina about um, the uh, Confederate battle flag. And I, uh, <laughs> I was wanting to know why certain people were interested in preserving uh, the status of the flag at the state capitol and why other people were interested in destroying the status of the flag. And so that um, started me uh, on a process of reading intensely, uh, intensely uh, at a very serious level, Southern history and Civil War history at the age of 13. And, uh, and so the if you, my library that you see behind me, I've been building that library since that time. And uh, I have taken it with me everywhere I've moved to. And I hope and anticipate that this is its final resting place. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I wrote about South Carolina uh, agricultural traditions for my master's thesis, but I wanted to go much bigger for my PhD. I wanted to make the argument that um, Southern agrarian thought does not begin or end with what the what we call the fugitive agrarians, the Vanderbilt agrarians who um, published their manifesto in 1930, I'll take my stand. Uh, these people were interested in capturing a particular crossroads in the history of the South. The South was moving um, away from a more traditional way of life into the modern world. The 19th century lasted longer in the South than it did in other parts of America. And so by the time we get to 1930, there are some serious scholars who are trying to figure out what parts of our tradition do we need to move forward into the 20th century and what parts may we need to just leave behind. And uh, so I saw that same way of thinking to be very predominant among other writers and thinkers uh, uh, across the spectrum. And it wasn't simply a Southern phenomenon. There were uh, several people around uh, Europe and in, in uh, other parts of the United States who were also noticing industrialization and industrial capitalism gaining ground. And uh, they were very concerned about that. The distributists in England were operating very much at the same time that the Southern agrarians were in this country. But they didn't speak to one another very much, uh, not until 1936, when Herbert Agar and uh, Alan Tate uh, formulated a new collection of essays entitled Who Owns America? Uh, Hilaire Belloc wrote the final essay uh, for that book. And that's the only time that I know of where the distributists and the agrarians come together for a serious publication. And most people around the country don't know anything about that book. It's just, it's because there's, I think there were not, better off now than what we were in my grandparents' generation and my great-grandparents' generation. And the reason I chose the 20th century to write about, and I'm about done, and we can move on to something else. Between 1920 and 1960, there's a seismic shift in the way people live everyday life. Not simply in America, but in around most of the civilized world, Western civilization especially. Whereas in the year 1900, the majority of people were still making a living from the land. By the time we get to 1960, in the in decades immediately after the Second World War, more and more young people are deciding to do something else, to become uh, professional, to follow a career. And so I see that as a very significant historical sh shift because uh, somebody who was living around the year 1900 probably had more in common with um, late medieval Europe than they did uh, late 20th century society. Mm. And so that's what interests me. And it continues to interest me even now. Mm. 
There was an interesting detail in your dissertation where the uh, of the 12 what, fugitive agrarians, those who published the manifesto, you said that none of them chose to forsake their accustomed urban comforts to pursue a rural lifestyle themselves. I just thought that was an interesting observation, and I was wondering what you made of that. Well, they were not necessarily trying to go back to the land. Uh, they were this. They, these most of these people were all, were already well established literary artists. They had published several novels, and they were poets for the most part. And uh, a, a a good poet is is interested in in not telling a reading audience about himself. Uh, the best poets are always those who are able to place a mirror in front of the reader where you are able to uh, see something, learn something about who you are. And I think that's what the Southern agrarians were trying to do in 1930, not try to go back to the land themselves, but try to write something that was important to a um, fairly large reading audience that would help particularly rural Southerners understand that industrial capitalism is dangerous. The consumer culture that had begun had started to take off in the roaring twenties is very dangerous, and they were exactly right about that because uh, you have to remember that the Great Depression started in 1929, and uh, these people were writing about a defense of agrarian culture in the midst of massive upheaval in the economy of both Europe and the United States, uh, and they were rejecting industrial capitalism, but they were also rejecting communism, and um, and so I don't think it detracts from the central argument of Southern agrarianism to, to say that uh, the people who were articulating that tradition were not farmers themselves. Andrew Lytle, who was fairly young at the time, he actually lived until the 1990s. He was the last living, he was the last living fugitive agrarian. I never met him personally, but I have met several people who did know him personally. And uh, he wrote an essay in 1980 30 years, 50 years after I'll Take My Stand came out. And uh, he said, we never, we, we knew that there was going to be a shift in American society away from primarily rural lifestyles to primarily urban and suburban lifestyles. But what he admitted in 1980, and this is 1980, well over 40 years removed from us now, he said, we never imagined it would be this bad. We never imagined. He said, people who were working on family farms in America in 1930. One of the reasons they were not reading material in, uh, about the dangers of industrial capitalism is that they never thought that this particular American rural way of life would be endangered. Mm -hmm. So by 1980, as Andrew Lytle is looking back, um, he, he concluded that we none of us, none of us, meaning the fugitive agrarians, ever could have imagined that it would be this bad. And even now, it's it's worse. I mean, since the 1980s, um, less than one percent of the American population is involved in an agricultural lifestyle, and it's more than simply agriculture, and it's more than simply back to the land. Southern agrarianism is also a theological and a philosophical perspective. If somebody asks me if I'm a conservative or a liberal, my typical answer is I'm a Southern agrarian, uh, because that nomenclature can cover politics, economics, theology. It can cover a, a, the full spectrum much better than a simple economic uh, identification of conservatism or liberalism. So uh, anyway, that's that's my answer to that question. When you start asking me these questions about <laughs> big, big topics, we can go uh -huh. into different tangents and I have to stop myself. <laughs> Fair enough. So you've described the American South as the last bastion of Western civilization on the North American continent. Uh, could you expand on that? Well, the South was never as comfortable with leaving the British Empire as the American North was. There was a, and, and part of that has to do with the immediate economic circumstances of the time. Uh, most of the money in the American South came from plantation agriculture during that point in American history. And, um, Regardless as to what people think about the institution of slavery, the fact remained economically that Southern planters and Southern politicians, the people who controlled most of the land, particularly on the seaboard, uh, they relied upon the British Empire to help them market their tobacco, their cotton, their rice to other countries around the world. And they were 
they knew full well that if there is American independence, we have to do all this on our own. It was very much a transatlantic society um, in the colonial period. And it remained so in the American South far longer than it did in New England and other places in the North. Um, uh, Puritanism never took hold in the South as it did in New England, Massachusetts, and, and, and so forth. There is an old religiousness, and actually, I've, I've, I, right before our right before our uh, interview, I was reading uh, the Southern Essays of Richard Weaver. Now, I don't know if this comes up backwards on the screen. Or no, not. that's right. That's uh, front facing. Yep. Yeah, but this is a book uh, published by the Liberty Fund. Well, it's not originally published by the Liberty Fund. They're printing it now. And uh, this essay is probably from the 1940s. Uh, Richard Weaver uh, was probably more agrarian than the Southern agrarians from Nashville were. And he's got an essay in here uh, entitled The Older Religiousness of the South. And um, I just want to read to help answer that question a, a couple of lines here. Um, and, and he's making an argument that even though the South from the colonial period forward was primarily Protestant, it was overwhelmingly more orthodox Christian than any Puritan strain we see in the American North. And so this is, this is uh, Richard Weaver here, 1948, I think is the year. A sense of restraint and a willingness to abide by the tradition were universally viewed as marks of a gentleman. On the other hand, the spirit of discontent, of aggressiveness, and of inquisitiveness was associated with those who had something to gain by overturning the established order. So Flannery O'Connor, Flannery O'Connor uh, once said that the day might come when the spiritual traditions of the American South are best preserved through the Catholic Church. Of course, Flannery O'Connor is one of the most famous Southern writers of the past century one of the most famous Southern writers of all time, actually. And uh, I think she's right about that. Um, and so I don't think that Western civilization, which was once simply called Christendom, can be preserved without this sense of older religiousness. Even though if you were, talk, if you were to just ask many random people in the South um, about the Catholic Church, they probably couldn't tell you much about it. Um, they, they have never been taught much of anything about it. But if you ask them about Christ and if you ask them what they believe, overwhelmingly it's going to be a Christian-oriented answer. Secular humanism has had a hard time taking root in the American South, very hard time. Uh, the only place where it has taken root is some urban centers and in the universities. But um, I, there's... But people see through this. People see through through this. When I was at Mississippi State University, I taught um, um, college courses. I taught some of the undergrad uh, history courses um, while I was finishing my doctorate. We probably had three hundred students in in the auditorium at one time. I had a fun time uh, teaching those students, and I was teaching from a primarily Christian historical viewpoint. I never had any backlash from the student body because these were good Mississippi people and they knew, exa they knew exactly what I was saying. This is the way they were brought up. The only people I received backlash from was the chair of the history department who was from New York City who had been educated in Cincinnati, Ohio. And, and so he completely didn't understand um, uh, the genius, the historical traditional genius of the Southern mind in these very much rural people who were attending university. And this in Mississippi State is a land grant school. It's an agricultural school. These people are not here to become um, uh, secular humanists. They, they're here to better the condition of their family farm. And so I think it's absolutely hilarious that these people are moving down south to find jobs. I actually asked the chair of the history department at Mississippi State one time. He, uh, what during my tenure there, he hired probably four or five new professors. And they were all from up north. They were all from New York, Michigan, New Jersey, places like that. And they were by no means Christian, not one of them. And I walked to his uh, office one day and I says, uh, 
why are you hiring all these people from up north to come to Mississippi to teach Mississippi people about their own history? <laughs> and he's <laughs> and he was very serious about his answer. He said, we have, I, I want to hire people who have a missionary zeal. So his mentality liter literally was, we have to re-educate the people who are down here. We've got mm -hmm. to re-educate -re them. They're too Christian. They're too conservative. They're backwards. Uh, and that's a term that is often used to describe the American South. It, 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 most recently in 2015, um, and after the shootings in Charleston, um, with Dylan Roof, the American South once again became the nation's whipping boy. That was a horrible incident. It was a very horrible incident, and it never should have happened. But that boy was insane. He was a lunatic. And just because they found Confederate battle flags in his bedroom, then it blows up. The South is all evil. The South is just not worth paying attention to. There was an interesting history book came out in the 1960s entitled Cavalier and Yankee, uh, written by Professor William Taylor. And uh, even though the book is several decades old now, the argument is still as fresh now as it was then. He argued essentially in that book, what he did, he studied the travel diaries and the travel journals of people from the American North who traveled through the antebellum South basically from the 1830s to the late 1850s. And the common denominator of the diaries, this is what Professor Taylor concluded. Most everyone who traveled South before the Civil War concluded that it was too different from the American North, that one of two things needed to happen. Either the American South needed to be conquered militarily or it needed to be persuaded to change culturally through uh, more uh, educational efforts. So all of this is that when I first read that book, I thought this makes perfect sense because they're not the same. It is a miracle that the United States still exists. We are closer to civil war in this country than we've been since the late 1850s. The most important, and it's not necessarily North and South anymore. It's more rural and urban because um, there are uh, many people around the country who are fed up with with American liberalism now. Um, so the South has never been comfortable with removing itself from a medieval tradition. Historian Eugene Genovese wrote an excellent book uh, several years ago entitled uh, uh, The Southern Conservative Tradition. I'm, I believe it's the title. It was a very small, very small book. And he, he, in that book, he's making the argument that the South is fundamentally medieval in many ways. And a part of that medieval mentality is the Catholic Church, whether uh, Southerners know it or not. Alan Tate, even in his contribution to uh, I'll Take My Stand in 1930, said that one of the reasons the South was not successful in continuing to produce its own uh, vision of America in the 19th century is because it did not have the proper religion to support the culture. In other words, if the South had been primarily Catholic, then by the end of the 19th century, the American South would have been, it would, rather than being a poverty-stricken, militarily defeated part of the world, uh, it would have been one of the most vibrant parts of, of Christendom that you could possibly imagine. And I know that that's speculation, but I tend to think that he was right about it. That's really interesting. Uh, on the on the subject of the Civil War, you said you'd like to smoke a, a smoke a pipe with General James Longstreet. So I was wondering, could you tell us a bit about uh, General James? Uh, <laughs> and, that, and that can feed into some other questions. Uh, General James Longstreet was um, born not far from uh, where I grew up in South Carolina, and he was. Uh, a Catholic. A lot of people don't know that. General James Longstreet was a Catholic. He lost his wife and his children due to, uh, I think, uh, yellow fever in 1862 uh, during the war. And so he's most well known as the commander of the 1st Corps of the Army in Northern Virginia at the Battle of Gettysburg in 1863. Uh, and he's not well received uh, after the war because he he joins uh, the Republican Party. And at that time, the Republican Party was not 
a conservative or Southern political party. The South was primarily Democratic until the 1960s. And uh, so General James Longstreet, he, he wrote his memoirs, his memoirs of the war, uh, because General Robert E. Lee asked him to. Uh, and so his book entitled uh, From Manassas to Appomattox, I read that when I was about 15 years old. And I so enjoyed it. And as I was reading it, I felt like I was getting to know the man, that I was uh, sitting in the same room with him as he was telling me the stories of the war years. And he was an avid pipe smoker and he enjoyed cigars. And so I would so enjoy being able to sit down and visit with him if it were possible. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Uh, so you've lamented that the American South has been misrepresented in many ways. I was wondering if you could tell us uh, some of the dominant narratives which you think are false or inaccurate. Well, it, it, again, I've taught history. Uh, I've been teaching history at various levels, high school, college, graduate school, since I was about 22 years old. And what I often have to battle is uh, the way popular media has portrayed the South. And it, it can get very, very ugly at times. Uh, most people do not have an understanding of the South. Shelby Foote, who I've talked about on my uh, channel a great deal, he's my favorite Civil War historian. Uh, and he has gone on record, and I think he's actually said this in some YouTube interviews that you can find online. He uh, made the, the, the most perfect point about this subject. He said that it has been presumed that just because one side of the conflict uh, had chattel slavery and the other side did not, that the conflict was about slavery. And uh, Foote adamantly opposed that, that conclusion. And uh, he said that, that, that the Confederacy respected law above all things. And this, it was a difficult... Th th what people need to basically what the modern history profession teaches is that the history of the American South, the main theme is race. The main theme is race. That is the central, the, the central point, the the most unique aspect of Southern history. Well, I think people need to realize that um, only in the American South have you had such a long history of people from two different traditions living together in the same geographical area that create their own unique culture. I mean, the culture of Africa and the culture of Europe, they all come together in the American South to create something that is entirely unique and it's beautiful. Uh, and so, but, but historians don't want to look at that. Thomas Sowell, Thomas Sowell, who you may have read, mm -hmm. uh, he's, he's one of the most important economic professors in, uh, that, that's existed in this country the past 100 years. He wrote a book several years ago entitled Conflict of Visions. And uh, he, he made the point that when you look at history, you either look at it from one of two perspectives. You look to see accomplishment and achievement, or you look to see grievance and victimhood. Unfortunately, the American history profession is controlled by the latter. People who are building careers off of writing books about grievance and victimhood. Just as we can do that in our time, if we want to find achievement in the lives of other people around us, we can see it. If we want to find the ugly parts of life, we can see that too. Uh, but I think that uh, the current history profession is not balanced. It's much bigger than uh, the history of the American South. I mean, the history of uh, the United States, the, the history of history itself, historiography, is, is is being absolutely destroyed by people who are building personal careers off of these stories of victimhood and grievance. And you've got to be careful with that. Uh, history is perhaps the most politically motivated discipline that we have in the humanities. It is very politically motivated. Because if you can control how people understand their past, if they think about the past at all, then you can shape identities. You have the power to shape identities. And that's a dangerous, dangerous power. And uh, the best historians, I think, in the future are going to be historians who do not go to graduate school, who are uh, 
not tainted by that experience, who are highly intelligent people, and they're able to do research on their own. And so I have decided to leave the academic world, at least for now, so that I can concentrate on my own writing and my own work, which I've not been able to do since I finished my doctorate because of the immense amount of work that has to go into reading dissertations, and, and, and it's just too much. But um, there is a, mo most people who live in the South don't care anything about the way the popular media in the academic world sees us. Um, there is no institute in Europe that studies the American North. There are institutes in Europe that study the American South. Um, <laughs> I mean, have you when when have you heard great country songs about life in old Oregon or life in old Massachusetts? No, 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 no. The, the two greatest contributions of the American South to the world is our music and our literature, because there's a life experience here. We're the only part of the United States that has ever known serious and immediate defeat, not only on the battlefield, but economically and in the mind. And so that's an experience that I think people can learn from, Christian or otherwise, Catholic or otherwise. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'll leave it at that. Okay. Uh, regarding misrepresentations of history, it was interesting to hear you say uh, that you like to call the Enlightenment the Endarkenment. Uh, so could you tell us uh, what your thoughts are on that? Well, one of the pro problems with the Enlightenment is th th this is where we see the, root, the roots of uh, a secular worldview that's now trying to just destroy all of our institutions in this country and many around the world. Um, I don't think that the medieval period should be properly called the Dark Ages. I mean, to, to get at this understanding of why people call the Enlightenment the Enlightenment, uh, you have to first go back to why people call the Dark Ages the Dark Ages. I, it, uh, I think um, if it were not for the Protestant Reformation, there probably would have been no Enlightenment. And uh, the there's just too much revolutionary change going on from 1500 through the 1700s. And it has a lot to do with the power of the individual, this battle between uh, the, the, power, the, the identity of an individual person and how that person relates to a large commu larger community. And um, I think that we took several wrong terms, turns during the uh, Enlightenment. The individual is important, but that individual is not atomistic it can't exist in and of itself it has to be a part of a larger community and so what i see happening as a result of both the protestant reformation and the enlightenment is this as uh Johann wazinga called it the waning of the middle ages the waning of the middle ages the idea of chivalry that we should do unto others as we would have them do unto us the idea of a gentleman all of this begins to break down and what it results in is this atomistic, atomistic individualism where I am able in and of my own right as a human being, as a free, uh, liberated human being, I can decide what truth is on my own. Whatever I think is true, that, that, that's, that's what I'm going to go with. And so the Enlightenment does great disservice to both the tradition of the church and the traditions plural of various small communities and in, in countries uh, around Europe and eventually the United States. And so I'm at the point now in a lot of my own thinking where I'm starting to uh, uh, wonder where the history of the United States Constitution and our Declaration of Independence falls in line uh, uh, with, with, with my disregard of the Enlightenment. Because everybody knows that Thomas Jefferson was heavily influenced by John Locke. And uh, that's that's fine. But Jefferson, I wouldn't go to Jefferson for spiritual advice. I mean, he did not believe that Christ was divine. He had some serious issues there. Uh, but he did believe in the rights of individual people to decide their own destiny. So I do believe that that's a good point. Individuals should be able to make their own decisions to decide what they're going to do with their life, who they're going to marry, what they're going to do for a living. Uh, but at the same time, that can't be separated from an older tradition of some sort because there has to be a guiding experience something has to guide it and so i think the enlightenment went a little bit too far uh, it became far too intellectual and not not 
at the expense of the spiritual, if that makes sense. Absolutely, yeah. So you've said uh, recently that the the purpose of education, you're quoting G.K. Chesterton, uh, is uh, to transfer the soul of a civilization from one generation to the next. Uh, we've already heard your thoughts on, I guess, the education system. Uh, so um, I guess, how do you see that transfer uh, transfer happening nowadays? How are we going to do it? Well, I can only speak about an American experience. I don't know how they do it in your country or in any other country. Um, but I did uh, visit Ireland, and I've told people this on my, my channel, but I remember very distinctly, I was in Ireland uh, in 2008. I spent two or three weeks there. And I've not done that's I've not done much international travel, but I remember that trip very clearly. And I was taken aback by the historical consciousness of those people. I mean, these were not college educated people for the most part. These were sheep farmers and um, folks who had been living in the same village their whole life. And they were so happy. Well, they were probably happy uh, because they enjoy drinking a lot. <laughs> But they were, they were just, they were just so happy and content with their life, with their part of the world, with the tradition they were raised in. And uh, I just enjoyed every moment of that trip because I could speak to those people about the past. They were, they were, they, they could point to a, a tree or a hill over, over over yonder and tell me what Oliver Cromwell did over yonder in, 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 uh, during the interregnum period. And I'm thinking, my goodness, our own people in the United States, they don't have that anymore. There's not historical consciousness for the most part. Uh, so I think that education properly done begins at the home. Uh, it is the responsibility of the parent, the parents and the grandparents to make sure that first of all, family tradition is handed down from one generation to the next. Uh, and then secondly, we get to the church. I think that the church uh, has an immense responsibility uh, to, and this is one of the things that drew me to the Catholic church from my Protestant upbringing. The Catholic church makes it very clear uh, that the catechism must be taught that the younger generation needs to be brought up in the faith to not only love Christ with their heart, but to understand the teachings of the church intellectually. And most of those teachings come from history. And uh, so, uh, so after that, you've got, you know, of course, uh, the various subjects that you study it, it, as a school age child. And we have thought about homeschooling our children. Uh, I don't know that we're going to do that. Uh, we're probably going to put them in uh, a local school because I want my children to be around other people in the community. Uh, and so there's, there's, you have to weigh things in the balance. Uh, they're going to know what they believe, what what we believe is their parents, but they're going to have to. I want them to experience the world they're going to have to live in uh, sooner rather than later. I don't want them to be sheltered to the extent that when they leave home, they have no idea how to defend their faith, how to speak intelligently about what they believe. And uh, but 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 at the collegiate level, at the collegiate level, uh, <laughs> it's it's a mess. It is a big, big mess. I think that if you are not well established in your faith and in what you believe to be true by the time you finish high school, say 17, 18 years old, then it's going to be an uphill battle for you to find people at the collegiate level who can serve as a proper intellectual mentor. Now, we still have some schools in this country where that does still happen. Hillsdale comes to mind. Uh, Hillsdale is doing some excellent work. Uh, Notre Dame is doing some excellent work. Uh, I can think of some smaller universities, uh, but I will I will say this: uh, if anybody's listening and you have college aged kids and you're thinking about where to send children for higher education, pay less attention to the environment of the school and the mission of the school pay more attention to the individual faculty members, particularly within the departments uh, that will be most involved with the education of your child. Uh, and so this is how I decided uh, where I wanted to go to school for my own graduate education, certainly. I paid very close attention to who was on the faculty. What did they publish? 
is this good work. It doesn't make any difference whether you believe with everything they say, uh, but but the, the, the best scholars, the best educated people are going to be those who simply learn how to do good work. If you do your job right, even if uh, uh, you're in a college classroom and people disagree with what you have to say, if you do it well, it doesn't matter if they disagree. It matters that you have done your job, that you have uh, defended the faith appropriately. You've defended your idea of truth and we're, as we're told to do in 1 Peter 3.15. And so um, it's a touchy subject, and it's not the same with, with every country around the world. But um, I think Chesterton would be appalled if he were to see the current status of our education system, particularly among those countries who stem from Western civilization. Yeah. Actually, so, I am going to be I'm going to be speaking at the G.K. Chesterton Society annual conference in July in Philadelphia. And um I am so looking forward to that. Uh, and I think that these extracurricular conferences and these extra different uh, meetings that people can go to outside of the secular universities, those are the people that become your real college. That's where the real college is, not necessarily people with PhDs on faculty that are, have tenure. Uh, so so that's that's my two cents worth about that question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so uh, a number of people know, some don't, that you were received into the Catholic Church. Was it November last year? Yep, November 12th was confirmation. Uh -huh, wonderful. And, and we are so enjoying it, so enjoying it. I mean, it's wonderful to know that I don't have to figure everything out anymore. By becoming Catholic, I have a wealth of historical information and experiences from the saints that I can draw from the wonderful literature that 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 is in this in this tradition and i truly believe that the catholic church is the one holy apostolic church established by christ himself and i reached a point where i i believe that um, now that i do see the catholic church as being absolutely true in what it says it would be a grave sin not to accept it not to accept it and so um that's where we are. We have been so happy and filled with joy. And I just wish I could share that with other people who think that the Catholic Church is wrong, but you can't do that. It's a process. It's a journey. So, yeah. 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 You've remarked that uh, what you appreciate about the liturgical life of the Catholic Church is how, how it uh, incorporates the seasons, corresponds to the natural world. Uh, yes. And I was wondering, do you think the rediscovery of a, a sacramental worldview might be a key to uh, achieving reenchantment in the West, where we kind of fall back in love with life? Absolutely. If you don't love God's creation, I don't know how you can love God himself. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I just I, that there's a connection there. Uh, we are so far removed from the natural world and the way we live now. We have our air conditioning rooms. We have our computers that we live vicariously through. We can just... But I, I wish I could be a perfect Luddite and never see another computer in my life. I wish I could do that. But that's not that's not what God's called us to do. These are tools that we can use. But I think that people need to simplify, need to simplify the way they uh, approach uh, human life. Just go out and enjoy the natural world around you. Yes, I think there's a reason that God created seasons. I think there's a reason. Every spring reminds us of the resurrection. Every winter reminds us that there is a better time coming. Uh, even though everything looks dead now, there, it, it, it will come to life again. The familiar life, the familiar joy uh, that we're used to during the warmer season, it will return. And so I think the history of Western civilization goes and everything is, is, is in seasons, everything. And, it, and people come in and out of our life for a season. There are certain people that have come into my life um, for a season and they go out, but they serve a purpose. And I can only hope to do the same, um, whether it's digitally or whether it's personally with, with people in my community. If there's some season of their lives that I can contribute to, I'd love to be able to do that to the best of my ability. Liturgical living has added an element to my life that I didn't know was possible. I didn't know it was possible. It 
and one of the reasons that I enjoy a, a liturgical lifestyle is that it, it puts you in connection to antiquity. Uh, it reminds you that everything that matters didn't begin the day you were born. Uh, there is an ancient tradition. When I go to mass, when I participate in Lent, when we, and we just went through our first Advent in the Catholic Church this past December, you are reminded that God has a plan, not simply for eternity, but for each season of life. Every single day, there's a plan in order. We can't see it, but God's got it under control. And the Catholic Church is the catalyst, the catalyst to keep everything in order, a well-ordered and well-balanced lifestyle. And uh, even the catechism, uh, you mentioned the natural world, even the catechism speaks about the importance of preserving the natural world and respecting God's creation. And, and that is extremely interesting to me. And uh, so I'm, I'm actually going to, in the process of writing, first of all, an essay about that topic, and then it will eventually become a book. I'm writing an essay now for a new uh, book that's coming out and a collection of essays from Tan Publishers. Uh, and the title of the book is going to be Liturgy of the Land. That's and it's going, it's going to be an essay about why why Catholics and, and particularly Americans uh, should pay attention to the Southern agrarian tradition. And so uh, I, this stuff is on my mind constantly when I'm not taking care of children and <laughs> doing everything else. But I'm excited. Uh, being a Catholic, being a part of a liturgical lifestyle, it gives you a sense of support and uh, meaning. Life means more when you wake up in the morning because uh, you realize that you're not in the life is not about you alone. You're a part of a larger tradition and God has allowed me to be a part of it. He has asked, invited me, you, anybody else. He wants us to be a part of it. And so God is the author of order, not confusion. And the liturgical life shows that every single day. Yeah, great. Speaking of the liturgical life, uh, you live amidst nature. Uh, you have a large property. Could you, you could you describe that property for us and and just tell us how you spend your Sabbath? We have over two hundred acres here in Kentucky, and I love it. I, I I love being able to control the land around me and have privacy. We're insulated here. I think that's the best way to raise a family uh, now. I think it's always been the best way to raise a family. Not in an apartment, not in a subdivision, not in a suburban environment, but where, where God's creation is surrounding the home. It's essentially a house should be placed in a situation where God through his creation is just putting a big old hug around it. <laughs> you just see God and his wonderful creation all around you. That's, that's, I think that's the way God actually intended it to be. Um, of course, we have to go into the highways and the hedges. We have to go where people are hurting. Um, and so uh, what we do here, we, we don't actually farm anything that makes an income. Um, we bought the land for basically a place to raise our children. We've got probably a half a mile of creek frontage. It goes down through the middle of the property. Beautiful, absolute beautiful valley down there. We have horses. We use the land primarily to ride our horses, and we enjoy uh, riding horseback, my wife and I. And uh, so we have a wonderful community. This is not a primarily Catholic community. Uh, when we go to Mass, we have to drive at least 45 minutes. And if you're going to be catholic in rural america there is a parish in almost every part of, of the united states but you, you've got to be willing to drive if you're not fortunate enough to live uh close enough to a church or so sometimes we'll travel down to knoxville tennessee and go to the cathedral of the sacred heart of jesus which is uh just beautiful it's just so gorgeous and uh and that's about an hour and 20 minute drive from us so our Sabbath uh, involves a great deal of road time, and that's uh, just the way it has to be. But in the evenings, uh, we usually have a family prayer time, and we will just do what the Sabbath was intended to do, spend it uh, 
thanking God for his blessings, uh, praising the Lord for the joy that we have through a life in Jesus Christ and being very, very close to those who are around us, our, our spouses and our children. So it's simple. It's a simple thing. And, but, but I think there is great beauty and simplicity. It's wonderful. Um, you, you referenced before the uh, kind of hyper individualism of the, of modern life. I mean, I guess the atomization that results from that. Um, and so there's a, a, a strong desire, I suppose, for rootedness. And uh, it got me thinking about uh, a monastic vow that a number of religious take, which is um, they, they promise to stay in their community for life. They're not going to move. Now, yeah. that's uh, perhaps too idealistic for those of us who, who don't reside in monastic communities. But do you think it's possible or even wise to insist on that kind of rootedness or do we just have to be more pragmatic? I think that if you find the place where you're comfortable being rooted, then yes, absolutely. Dedicate your time and your energy and your full life to that community. But there is too much estrangement and dissatisfaction among people these days where they are currently. Mm -hmm. I mean, the United States is overwhelmingly urban. I would not say to somebody living downtown Chicago in an apartment, you need to be rooted here in this concrete jungle and you should never move. No, I would strongly encourage that person to find a wonderful place that is much smaller in a rural environment. I think everybody should live in the countryside. I don't like cities. I don't like them. I think cities, villages are good for commerce. They're good for visiting, but it's not a healthy place to live. And uh, it, you don't have to live 50 miles away from the city, but you can live, you can, it, it, we, we come into community uh, and, and communion with other people for certain portions of our life. But there needs to be a strong private home life where you're not worried about the concerns of everything outside of your home, but you're primarily focused on uh, what God, I think, has called particularly us as men to do, which is be the leader of a household, to focus on that leadership, not focus on um, trying to impress anybody uh, that's outside of our immediate immediate circle. But um, I, rootedness is extremely important. Uh, Wendell Berry, who is probably the most famous and su most successful rural writer in, in America right now, he has often said uh, that people should simply stay put, stay where you are. And I understand what Mr. Barry is saying with that. But uh, when you have a country that's overwhelmingly urban, as I said, I would never encourage by anybody to remain in a concrete jungle. Uh, move to a place where you can give your heart and your soul to that community, where you can really invest, really invest in it. And... Um, that's what we decided to do when we moved to Kentucky. Uh, we there was a once in a lifetime opportunity to buy this place. It's a long story of how it happened, but it was a once in a lifetime opportunity. And I knew when the opportunity arose that it was a once in a lifetime opportunity. I like to tell people that the opportunity of a lifetime is in the lifetime of the opportunity. And uh, if you are allowing yourself to be uh, crippled by fear or uh, un a worry about what tomorrow is going to bring, then it, nothing's ever going to happen. You can't wait for success and for joy. You can't wait for uh, the good things that God has given us in life to come to you. You've got to strive for it. You've got to move towards it. And you've got to be uh, really adamant in, in, in that effort. And so that's why we're here. I do not think for one second that there is any aspect of our life that God has not been working out. And, and he is, it, I think it, it, it is a blessing to the Lord when, when we delight in his presence and we delight in the gifts that he has offered us in this life. It can't compare to what we will ultimately experience in heaven with him. But we have an eternal soul in a temporary body. And as long as uh, my body's here on this temporary, uh, in this temporary existence, I'm going to enjoy every blessing that God has given. And so 
Rootedness is important, but remember uh, what we're taught in the New Testament. Our citizenship is in heaven. That's ultimately where the citizenship is. It's not in, on any particular farm or any particular country now. Uh, our citizenship is in heaven. And that gives me more joy than anything I could possibly talk about. Very good. All right, we're coming up towards the hour. So just one last question. Um, you, you did mention you have some writing projects, including that uh, delightfully so, delightful sounding title, Liturgy of the Land. Yeah. Uh, do you have any other things in the works? And also, in addition to that, uh, how can we, how can people support you uh, in your work? Well, I, I am uh, at the beginning of a book project um, that uh, I'm going to write it. Whether anybody wants to publish it or not, I'm going to write it. And so uh, it's going to be, uh, um, I want to explore the relationship between the Catholic Church and rural life, particularly with the past couple of hundred years. Because I think that one of the greatest uh, chances of, 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 of agricultural ways of living being preserved is actually through the Catholic Church. And so I want to explore that and in, in, in how that history, the Catholic land movement and so forth, how all of this comes together uh, from the 19th century until now. And so, uh, yeah, that's going on. But if you want to support uh, the pipe cottage, uh, and I don't know if anybody who watches your material are pipe smokers or not, but uh, we've got uh, an app, Pipe Cottage Social, that you can find on any app store. Um, and you can also... Uh, and subscribe to our channel, um, The Pipe Cottage, or uh, Dr. Alan Harrelson, my second channel that I have. But um, that's the biggest thing, just subscribe to what we're doing, because um, that helps us a great deal. And it, things have grown tremendously over the past four or five months, and I'm excited about it. Uh, and uh, it, 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 another thing, if you're in this country and you're going to be somewhere well, I, where uh, we will be lecturing or, or, or attending an event, uh, come by and say hi. And uh, what we're going to do on the Pipe Cottage website over the next couple of weeks is offer a list of the different places where we will be uh, going uh, over the course of the year. And so that's that's all I would say. And uh, it's just good to be here with you, Mark. Yeah. Well, thank you, Alan, for um, taking the time to be with us. Uh, if we could plug our own channel, if you like uh, hearing pe hearing from people like Alan, please like, share, and subscribe to our own channel, the Thomas More Center. Um, Dr. Alan Harrelson, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for your time, and I look forward to seeing what you get up to. God bless.